Order. And the sitting is resumed, and it's time for questions to the Minister for Regional Development. And we will start with listed questions, and I call Mrs. Brenda Hale. Mrs. Hale. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm very pleased to say that the Park and Ride site at Sprucefield has been uh, an outstanding success, uh, with a dedicated 20-minute service running to Belfast's Great Victoria Street bus station during peak hours on a cost of £6.10 p per return journey, or £22.50 uh, for a week. Uh, more, and more, uh, more and more commuters are seeing the benefits of switching to public transport. Uh, which is afforded priority over uh, other traffic on the inbound bus lanes on the M1. The existing site uh, holds up to 320 vehicles and is currently operating close to capacity. As such, my department intends, subject to the proposal uh, clearing the necessary statutory procedures, to provide a new 650 space park and ride site with full facilities at Sprucefield to expand the existing provision uh, in this area. Uh, in addition, uh, TransLink currently has proposals at the, uh, at, the, at the early feasibility stages of development to provide a park and ride facility on the former College of Further Education site at Knockmore Road, Lisburn. Delivery of this project will be subject to the necessary statutory approvals and the availability of funding. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And can the Minister assure this House that Park and Ride will not hinder further economic development at Sprucefield, Lisburn? I'm grateful to the Member for her supplementary question. Indeed, uh, my view uh, would be that uh, Park and Ride will, will complement uh, um, uh, retail uh, and indeed uh, better connectivity, connectivity and easier connectivity. Um, so uh, I, I think it is an undoubted success at Sprucefield, uh, and I look uh, forward to uh, hopefully bringing forward the, the new scheme, uh, which will uh, increase, enhance, and improve it. I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Um, would the minister be minded to look at the possibility of extending the bus lane in the M1 hard shoulder to incentivise motorists to reduce journey, journey times and incentivise motorists to take public transport into the city? Grateful to the member for asking uh, that question, I, and it is something that uh, we we are uh, giving consideration to. Uh, to uh, uh, but uh, obviously, um, uh, whilst there. Uh, may well be benefits in terms of the congestion, we would also have to ensure that um, there was uh, immediate and available access for uh, emergency vehicles, etc. But we are uh, uh, looking at that, uh, and I uh, would hope to, to say something about that in, uh, in the not-too-distant future. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be well aware of my lobbying on behalf of park and ride facilities, particularly in my own constituency of Upper Van. Can the Minister outline what plans TransLink have to progress additional sites in this and the next financial years? Grateful to the member uh, for uh, her, her question. And indeed, uh, TransLink has proposals to take forward uh, the following seven park and ride uh, rail and bus schemes in 2014-15 uh, and 2015-16. And they include, in terms of rail, Balamoney, White Abbey, Collibaki. Uh, Moira in terms of bus, the Valley Martin area of Belfast, uh, but of particular um, uh, attention to her, uh, and I hope she will be pleased by it, we, we also intend to develop sites at both Portadown and Lurgan uh, in the Upper Band constituency, and I've no doubt she will be pleased at that news. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Mr David McNary. Question two. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, maintaining the road network continues to be uh, one of my department's highest priorities. In Northern Ireland, there are some 16,200 miles of publicly maintained roads, uh, including 5,800 bridges and 295,000 illuminated assets, which include streetlights. <coughs> Maintenance funding comes from both my department's capital and resource budgets. Capital structural maintenance is carried out to improve the long-term condition of the network and includes uh, activities such as resurfacing and surface dressing, whereas the resource budget uh, is used to fund the day-to-day -day maintenance operations such as patching, which is part of uh, structural maintenance, grass cutting and winter service. It has been uh, independently established that some £133 million 
uh, at 2012 prices uh, is required annually to maintain the network. The current structural maintenance uh, budget is some £65 million, leaving a shortfall of £68 um, During the past three financial years, the respective amounts spent on structural maintenance were, in 2011-12, £7,633 per mile, in 2012-13, £6,929 per mile, and in 2013-14, £8,291 per mile. Call for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his very interesting answer. I picked up on him saying, uh, using the word shortfall. Uh, Minister, your department says uh, of the average £160 road tax income per vehicle received, it spent £118 only in 2010, and last year up that to £138. That's a shortfall of £44 million and £23 million, respectfully. Uh, raised by our motorists but not spent here. In the light of that, would you give an undertaking to the House to obtain the transfer of excise duty and publish annually the amount raised and the amount spent on road maintenance? Well, I'm grateful to the, to the member for his uh, uh, supple, uh, supplementary question. and Indeed, he poses me quite a, an interesting challenge, um, not only for uh, myself, which I have uh, no difficulty uh, uh, attempting, but also uh, I, I assume that it, it will mean that I will be uh, actively engaged with uh, the EFP and executive colleagues uh, as we would seek uh, to, to, to make that change and see uh, if, if benefit there, therefore could be accrued. Uh, but I do say that um, you know, we, I, I have uh, consistently argued uh, uh, the case for um, uh, uh, adequate finance in terms of our, our, our roads maintenance and structural uh, issue around the executive table, and I think the, uh, the member of uh, as a, the member as a, as, a, as a member of the committee of regional development uh, will accept that. And indeed, the committee have been pleased uh, uh, in the past have given me uh, support for that, and I hope very much that that will continue. Thank you. And I call Mr. Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The uh, Minister will be aware, as I'm sure all members are of the House, of examples where uh, resurfacing schemes have taken place only uh, for very soon after that uh, public and private utilities to come in and often dig up the roads and then leave it in a condition that often taxpayers find uh, unacceptable. What more can be done by the Department to prevent those circumstances from taking place? And when they do, what responsibility can be put on uh, those utilities that uh, carry out that work to make sure it is restored to the manner in which it was before they started their work? Grateful to the member for his uh, question. I, I mean, I, I can say that. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I do realise that that uh, uh, there are occasions in which that uh, uh, appears to happen, and indeed does happen. Uh, we try and minimise those as much as possible in terms of. Um, uh, being aware uh, of schemes being undertaken by the different utilities, and of course, uh, we we have a holdback period of uh, up to a year um, uh, if if we're not entirely satisfied uh, that um, uh, it is absolutely necessary to be done at that time. And of course, where if there are cases uh, where the uh, repair work uh, carried out by any of the utilities or indeed anyone else uh, is found to be unsatisfactory or substandard. Uh, we are very active uh, in ensuring that, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that work is, uh, is done to an acceptable level, even if it means uh, insisting that uh, uh, contractors return. Um, uh, it is something that I uh, am interested in uh, personally and uh, give the member uh, assurance that uh, we limit very much uh, the number of cases. I think we, it has improved over recent years. Uh, and of course, uh, it is something that we, we always bear in mind. Thank you. And I'll call Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm being very careful not to shoot the messenger because he inherits a, an awful legacy of neglect in terms of road safety. But can the Minister go on accepting the crumbs from the rich man's table in terms of depending on monitoring rounds to actually shore up a maintenance programme that's deteriorating by the day? 
Well, I'm grateful to the member for, for, the, uh, for the point that he, that, that he makes, and I would uh, r rather have um, a, a, a budget that is differently structured. And certainly, um, the, uh, it, I think it would make more sense uh, for that budget uh, to be uh, established and known at the start of a financial year. It would certainly make for better planning. It would also actually um, give us a better chance to get more benefit for the money that we would spend in terms of the timing of work being carried out. So I, I have been uh, carrying forward uh, that argument uh, around the executive table and to uh, the finance minister, and will continue to do so. I wonder can the minister actually give us an estimate of how much money uh, might come from uh, uh, to road maintenance from the October monitoring round? Well, the uh, member uh, should know. I think that we 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 are bidding uh, significantly for um, monies at the October monitoring. I think in terms of uh, the capital resource, we bid for something like 45 million. Um, and obviously, uh, we can, uh, without fear or favour, we can spend that money. Uh, early indications um, would indicate that that we're not going to receive that type of amount. And if, uh, in fact, uh, it, may, it may be that only a third of that amount and, um, could be available for structural maintenance. Um, and I have to say, I, I, I am concerned about that because I, I feel that the network uh, needs to be constantly. Uh, maintained, uh, and uh, as we approach, uh, particularly the the, uh, the deeper winter period, I think it's important that we uh, get the um, uh, opportunity to spend as much on structural maintenance and reduce uh, the likelihood of uh, of uh, indeed accidents or incidents, and indeed uh, also reduce uh, the, the potential for for claims against the department. I'll call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Uh, with the Speaker's permission, <clears throat> I'd like to reply to questions three and seven together, as they are, are on the same subject. Um, the implementation phase of the Belfast Rapid Transit project began in May uh, this year. Uh, work is currently progressing well on the construction of uh, a new 520 space park and ride facility at Dundonald. It is anticipated that this will be operational in December and will be served by existing TransLink services prior to Belfast Rapid Transit becoming operational in 2017. Work is also progressing on, on the sections of the Belfast Rapid Transit route on the Upper Newton Arch Road between Sandown Road and Knock Road and on the Falls Road between Grosvenor Road and White Rock Road. The works have been well publicised in advance and details of the impacts on low traffic are available on my department's Traffic Watch NI website. In May this year, uh, I committed funding to enable the procurement of the rapid transit vehicles to commence. Uh, it will take approximately three years from procurement to delivery uh, of the proposed fleet of 38 vehicles. The new Belfast rapid transit system is scheduled to become operational in 2017, subject to the completion of the necessary statutory processes and the availability of finance. And uh, I call Mr. William Humphrey for a supplementary. Yeah, thank you very much. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, pleased and welcome the development uh, in East and in West Belfast. But can I ask the Minister if he can inform and advise the House has, uh, has he any plans or any idea as to when the great constituency of North Belfast will be included in the rapid system? Um, grateful to the member for his supplementary and. and uh, while it's not a prophet and a son of a prophet, I think we were able to perhaps identify the question that he might ask. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the, the pilot network which my department is currently developing will connect East Belfast, West Belfast and Titanic Quarter uh, and through the city centre. But the department intends to extend the network uh, to the north and south uh, of the city. Uh, of course, this is subject to the success of the pilot routes and the availability uh, of funding. Uh, my department is already engaging with those responsible for proposed developments on potential routes uh, outside the current pi pilot network, including DSD and the University of Ulster, to ensure, as far as possible, that the future provision of Belfast rapid transit uh, to key areas uh, is not prejudiced. So I think there is some good news. I call Mr. Dahi Mackay. 
Can I get a, a brief last conclusion? Uh, and can I start just by congratulating the Minister on the successful cycling conference that the Department held uh, last week, and something that cyclists uh, often come across are problems in regard to bus lanes. Uh, now in regard to the BRT lanes, could the Minister outline uh, what vehicles will or will not be allowed in those lanes, uh, how discussions in regard to that are progressing, uh, as this will obviously have an impact on possible travel times and also sustainable transport? I'm grateful to the, to the member for his uh, uh, supplementary question and indeed uh, almost blushed uh, uh, at his high praise for the, uh, uh, for, the uh, for the cycling conference last week. And I particularly want to pay a tribute uh, to, to the organisers of, of that in my cycling uh, unit uh, in the department. I think they, uh, they excelled themselves. There was a high quality of, uh, 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 from, the, from the speakers that we um, had engaged. There was huge interest. Uh, and I thank the member and indeed uh, other members, including the chair of the Regional Development Committee who uh, attended and, and other assembly members who, who dropped in to, uh, to hear some of the benefit. Uh, that in itself will, will, will be uh, um, put on the web at some stage so that others who weren't there will be able to share uh, in the success of it. Uh, in terms of the, uh, of the, of the vehicles, um, uh, he will know that we are um, uh, uh, going forward with a particular model, uh, the bus type model, um, some people call it the bendy bus, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the, it's a bus that with capacity will be able to uh, hold uh, more passengers. Cyclists, of course, will be uh, allowed into that uh, uh, into the bus lanes as present, as presently, uh, and we see very much uh, the opportunity for for the rapid, rapid transit system to uh, to provide huge benefits uh, uh, for for the city of Belfast. We expect it also to have an integrated ticketing um, system, and of course, it, it will also. Um, uh, be incorporated into and integrated with the new Belfast bike hire scheme, which is scheduled to come into operation early next year. Cycli cyclists, a keen cyclist he is himself, I'm aware of that, those with folding bicycles will be able to carry their, their, their bicycles onto the, the BRT uh, vehicles. Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I assure the Minister that my question isn't facetious? Sometimes members have to call it. And would he agree with me that uh, progress in the Belfast rapid transport system is far from rapid, and given what he's outlined, is in fact going at snail's pace? Well, I, uh, whilst I'm grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary question, I, I'm afraid I, uh, I don't agree with him. Uh, I think we, we have pursued this scheme uh, with considerable vigour. We continue to do so. Uh, we've learned important lessons uh, from other major cities, including uh, Nantes. We've engaged with uh, stakeholders and other interested parties, and including uh, those from residential areas who will be impacted upon. I think um, it is not a piece of work that you can uh, simply uh, impose on communities or uh, indeed um, uh, um, sort of create uh, magically, as it were. So uh, I, I think we've, been, we're, we've adopted the right approach. Um, I hope very much that, that, that he uh, recognises the benefits uh, of a rapid uh, transit system, and I do hope that he'll be a little less cynical or perhaps even less negative uh, about it. i uh, very happy to uh, ask officials to give him a, a full briefing to, to reassure him. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I wonder, as we're talking about rapid transit, and I know the Minister has visited the Blood Hut outside on the apron, whether he might adopt that as either the departmental car or some of the technology for faster transit in the future. <laughs> <coughs> Conscious, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of the, of the number of bloodhounds in this chamber, uh, without having to without having to leave it. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I, seriously, I do think, uh, and I congratulate actually the member on, on making the arrangements to, uh, uh, so that the Bloodhound could visit uh, Parliament buildings today. I, I recommend, uh, for those who haven't had the chance to at least look at it, to, to go and do so. Uh, but I think, um, as opposed to a high-speed vehicle of that nature, uh, which is capable, I think, of 1,000 uh, miles per hour at certain locations, not at Parliament buildings, I hasten to add, but, um, 
but what we are uh, about to deliver is uh, a rapid transit uh, system for Belfast, and that I think will will uh, will assist people greatly um, and uh, enhance public transport. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the introduction of the improved public transport in the constituency of East Belfast. Can I ask the Minister how important he thinks uh, effective bus lane enforcement will be to the success of the Belfast rapid transport system? Grateful to the member for his, um, uh, his question. And, and indeed, I, I, I do uh, think that um, one of the key components of Belfast rapid transit system, and indeed, uh, the use of uh, using bus lanes as priority bus lanes. Um, they, they should be what it says on the tin. Uh, and uh, those uh, motorists or whatever who, 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 uh, who currently uh, abuse uh, the instructions that are given to them, I think, are, are causing difficulties and further congestion to, uh, to the system within Belfast City Centre. I regret that, and as the member knows, we are looking at the possibility. Uh, in, in fact, we're looking at the proposal to introduce um, an enforcement uh, fines. I hope that that will have the support not only of the Regional Development Committee, uh, the member himself, but indeed uh, the House generally. Because I do think, without that, uh, I, I, I think whilst carrots work in some cases, I think sometimes we also need a bit of stick. Thank you, and I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Castelver Cahar, question four. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. De Principal Deputy Speaker, the Rural Borewell Scheme, uh, funded by the, my department and administered by the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, was launched on the 6th of June 2012. The principal aim of the scheme was to provide a good quality water supply for existing properties that have never been served by a uh, public water main. Uh, the first year of the scheme, launched in 2012, assisted 24 properties to obtain a good quality water supply for the first time. The 2013-2014 scheme assisted 38 properties. The 2014-2015 scheme is scheduled to assist approximately 28 properties. In total, I anticipate uh, that 90 householders will receive a new bore well and or treatment uh, by the end of the third year of the scheme and will have the assurance of a high-quality water supply that is safe to drink uh, for the first time. Mr. I want to thank the Minister for his answer. And at the time, it was a very welcomed uh, scheme, Minister, particularly in rural areas where people lived far from the main uh, water system. And I welcome the numbers that you have outlined today. Uh, but can you give me a breakdown on, uh, in, particularly in counties, on the numbers that have availed of the scheme? Okay. Grateful to the, to the member for his uh, um, uh, question and indeed uh, for his support for the, for, for the scheme. Uh, as I've said, um, the, uh, it's anticipated that 90 householders will uh, have received a new bore well and or treatment by the end of the third year. Um, an initial assessment exercise carried out by my department at the beginning of the project identified three areas which had large numbers of unserved properties, uh, the Glens of Antrim, Spurrens and South Armagh. This initial uh, assessment has largely been confirmed by the applications received by DART officials who operate the scheme. Um, by the end of the third year of the scheme, the geographical spread across Northern Ireland has been as follows. In Antrim, there have been 36 bore wells, Armagh five. Down 8, Fermanagh 6, Londonderry 15, and Tyrone 20. And in anybody's mathematical uh, prowess, that adds up to 90. Call Mr. Joe Byrne. Yeah, thanks, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker. I, I thank the answers from the Minister, and I thank him for his help and time to address this issue. Does the Minister have any idea how many households are still in Northern Ireland without a public water supply? And would he accept that technology should be developed that in some way means water could be pumped even to highland areas? Thanks. I am grateful to the, <clears throat> to the member for his, um, uh, his supplementary question. He, he does raise an interesting point. Um, I think there is always a challenge uh, as to um, 
the, the cost uh, involved in, in, in providing a mains water supply. I think the benefit of this scheme has been that it has assisted people, uh, to householders, to um, get a cleaner and better uh, supply than they um, had hitherto uh, been um, uh, um, part of or whatever. So, um, I, whilst I, I, I Listen carefully to what the member says. I think they, they, there are excessive costs uh, in, in many of the, particularly rural locations, um, and uh, th that has to be borne in mind. So I think that that's been one of the benefits of the Borewell scheme, uh, and I hope the, the member will accept that. Thank you, and I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five to the minister. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, as the member will know, uh, my department is facing significant resource budget constraints, uh, and I'm not in a position to spend money that I do not have. Uh, consequently, I have had to take a number of difficult decisions, including the suspension of works orders to external contractors who were responsible for the repair of approximately three quarters of the street lights that go out. Um, I readily acknowledge that since street lighting uh, is provided as a road safety measure, uh, these cuts have the potential to lead to safety issues for road users during the hours of darkness. Uh, can I assure you that uh, to deal with the health and safety implications, I have set priorities uh, for dealing with street light faults. Priority will be given to those faults that present uh, an electrical hazard to members of the public, and contractors will still be employed to deal uh, with those faults. My department's uh, operations and maintenance staff, who can uh, provide around 25 per cent of the overall resource uh, to, uh, required to fix street lighting faults, will endeavour to repair as many lights as possible, prioritising large groups of lights uh, which are out and then individual lights that have failed. Regrettably, the impact of the cuts mean that, uh, in all likelihood, uh, a, larger, uh, a large number of street lights will be out over the winter months. I can tell uh, the member and indeed the House that currently some 11,261 lights are out right across Northern Ireland. This is not the service uh, that I would like to provide, uh, but it is the inevitable consequence of the budgetary pressures my department is facing. Call Mr. McCarthy for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answers. Although far from being satisfied, the Minister, his department, did uh, at a recent meeting of the DRD committee inform the committee that where the department provides street lighting, it has a duty to maintain it. And the Minister goes on to say that he has uh, cancelled the contractors that do maintain uh, those lights. How, how can the Minister quickly? Uh, rectify the situation and gain some credibility, uh, bearing in mind the, the dangers that certainly senior citizens and old people will have in darkened streets and roads. Sure. Grateful to the member for um, his supplementary question. Um, not sure about gaining uh, credibility for me, but uh, I, I think what would be more important was to be gaining more money uh, for, uh, for my department. It um, would be a, a big start, actually. Can I say that uh, the member has um, uh, raised the, the legal aspect of it. Uh, the department has received legal advice on this issue. Um, my department will continue to inspect roads and footways as per the normal uh, inspection regime. All def defects will be recorded as normal. Um, however, due to the financial constraints, defects may not be repaired as quickly as normal, and all repairs will be prioritised on the basis of safety. Um, my department will uh, uh, continue to robustly uh, investigate and defend public liability claims uh, with every case turning on its own facts. How, uh, however, ultimately, uh, it will be up to the courts to decide if the reduced standards comply with my department's statutory duty. But in, to, in, in short terms, uh, to Mr McCarthy, I, I would have to say if, if we had more money, we could deal with the situation. Mr George Robinson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I realise and appreciate the financial constraints that the Minister is under, but is there any special provision that could be given uh, where pensioners' bungalows are unlit, um, particularly coming in now to the winter months? Well, I'm grateful to the, uh, to the member for his um, uh, sympathy uh, for the uh, financial position that I find myself in. Uh, and and uh, I have outlined 
uh, how we have uh, been forced to prioritise things as a consequence of these cuts. You know, it's not a scenario that I, I enjoy or relish or want to see. I, I'd like to see proper, it properly resourced. I can understand the impact on uh, elderly or rural or more vulnerable uh, people uh, living in areas where, where a streetlight uh, does provide um, an essential form of, of comfort, if you like, particularly in dark winter evenings. So, uh, but I, 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 um, I, and I repeat again that um, it's not that we are ignoring uh, or will ignore um, lights that are out, but they will simply have to be prioritised uh, in a way that is consistent with um, uh, the, uh, the way I've uh, outlined. Order that ends the, uh, the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And Ms. Maid McLaughlin is not in her place, so I call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister um, provide the House with an update on the Macrofelt bypass? Uh, not sure, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, if that's a topical question or a typical question from the member, I think. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> but, uh, can I say a significant uh, advance works uh, are, are already underway uh, as part of the delivery of the £40 million Macrofelt bypass. Uh, surveys have been completed to identify potential archaeological sites. Uh, temporary fencing has been erected and, and trial pit excavations have been completed to help inform the detailed design under this design and build contract. Um, advance uh, archaeological investigative trenching and Vegetation clearance is anticipated to start in November uh, for completion prior to uh, the award of the main contract. Uh, the procurement of the main contract is well underway, and the tender return date is the 24th of uh, November 2014. Subject uh, to there being no challenges to the award of the contract, uh, con uh, construction work should commence uh, early next year. <coughs> I thank the Minister for his answer to my typical topical question, and I don't apologise for um, raising this issue, uh, as he, um, like um, his colleague beside, will know that it is an important issue for the local um, constituency. Um, I am glad the Minister has um, you know, confirmed that things are moving pro progressively, but can the Minister ensure that the work that is done with the consultants and road service officials in respect of dealing with the local farming community is um, kept up to date to ensure that they do know exactly what is happening and that any impact on their property is, is um, done in a lesser manner um, that would certainly be helpful to them. I am grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary uh, topical, topical question. And, um, Thank him for that, uh, and of course the, this scheme has a uh, huge benefit uh, for the for the Backerfeld area and indeed that uh, area uh, generally. Uh, and uh, I think one of the uh, one of the successes to any scheme uh, is the uh, cooperation uh, to extend to uh, local landowners and uh, information um, giving, particularly uh, on behalf of not only the contractor but the department in its early work. We have sought to do that. We will continue to do that. Uh, and I hope very much that we can uh, make progress and indeed um, enjoy the, the full cooperation of landowners and people uh, in that area because, of course, there will be issues, uh, there will be challenges, uh, there, may, there undoubtedly will be uh, inconvenience, but I think, uh, having waited 40 years as uh, Mrs Overend uh, continues to remind me um, uh, that this scheme has been um, in, the, uh, in the making. I think it is important that we, that we move it forward um, uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you. I will call Mr Trevor Lund. Yeah, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I want to ask the Minister about, about gully emptying. Uh, you know, this time of year you get autumn winds, you get leaves falling down and you get floods. And you get them, it seems to me, always in the same places. So, could I, can I ask him in, in general terms what, what priority he's able to give to the emptying of gullies given the financial constraints that he now operates under? I'm grateful to the, to, to the member uh, for, his, um, for his question. And indeed, um, 
the emptying of gullies uh, is a very uh, important issue. There are something like 550,000 gullies that the department seeks to maintain. Um, and that is a, a considerable challenge. It is made an even greater challenge when there uh, is not enough uh, in my resource budget uh, to, to pay external contractors to do the work that they do. Um, the, uh, the main work uh, for the gully, gully emptying is, is carried out by Transport NI staff. Uh, that represents about three quarters, 75 per cent uh, of, the, of the total work. So there is that potential for 25 per cent challenge. Uh, I, I have outlined to the House before uh, how uh, we seek to, to try and um, uh, deal with it, uh, and certainly in terms of wet spots. Um, where there are uh, issues of recurring flooding or where it has taken place in the past, uh, we, we, we do give priority uh, to, to those areas in addition to uh, other factors. Mr. Lund for supplementary. Yes, I uh, thank the Minister for his, his answer. And, you know, 550,000 is a fairly frightening total, but I would guess that you know, 500,000 of them don't actually cause too much of a problem. It's, it's these what you call hot, wet spots, I would say hot spots. And the, the damage that can, can be caused by that simple failure to un, unblock a gully, when you look into I'm sure, you, I'm sure the Minister has been in houses which have flooded. I mean, a bad flood does more damage than a fire in some cases, and takes much longer to sort out. So, is there any, is there any discretion within his budget to allocate money? I know it's difficult, but perhaps from major projects which may be held up to the more simple but very useful operations that I'm talking about. Well, I'm, I'm <coughs> grateful to the member for, um, uh, for the issue uh, that, he, uh, that he's raised. Um, I think, uh, I mean, there are 550,000 uh, gullies to be cleaned and emptied across Northern Ireland. Uh, and I'm not sure that that, uh, that proportion, uh, the proportion that he outlined uh, as perhaps not needing careful attention or uh, immediate attention, uh, would be as uh, as uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know uh, the number that he suggested. But um, what what I do say is uh, I, I do sympathise with those residents who are affected uh, by flooding. And we had uh, there were uh, there were many homes experienced flooding uh, late last week as a consequence of, of a high volume of rain. Forty per cent of the average October rainfall fell in areas of Belfast over a period of seven hours last Thursday night. Uh, and simply uh, that volume um, uh, is uh, is always uh, in danger of overcoming uh, any any system that is there. We do uh, continue to maintain to the best of our abilities. We are in the autumn season. We're uh, coming into the heavier winter season, and of course, the falling of, of leaves on, on a day like today, even uh, with the, with strong winds, I have no doubt that um, even work that has been done uh, in advance uh, to clean gullies over the last few days um, may well, you know, uh, be nugatory given the conditions that we have. That is a challenge that we have to deal with and, and uh, we attempt to do so uh, as efficiently as we can. But it is not helped when there are um, challenges to the budget. I do also say that uh, you know, we will continue to, to bid for resources to, uh, to deal with that. Um, his suggestion of transferring um, resources to capital uh, does not uh, work and is not uh, allowed in terms of the rules. Remember the remainder. I am sure the Minister is aware of the spate of uh, the recent theft of cars uh, in and around the Neary area, some of which has been parked at Neary Train uh, Railway Station. Uh, can the Minister advise what security measures are in operation um, at car parks for the uh, train stations, bus stations and car park and ride uh, facilities? Well, I am grateful to the uh, member for her, her question and, and obviously I uh, would join her in, in expressing my concern and condemnation uh, to, to those uh, who engage in such uh, activities. Clearly, um, uh, one hopes that uh, uh, individuals can be identified and, and that they, uh, 
the SNI can take appropriate action to put them before the courts, and the courts can deal with them uh, sufficiently. Um, I think uh, there, there are issues of security, um, and of course uh, CCTV is deployed in, in some or many uh, of our stations. Um, I will uh, look um, at the situation uh, in relation to Newry Station, sometimes more commonly known as Bestbrook Station. But uh, we, uh, I undertake to, uh, that I'll look at that for the member uh, and uh, see if any additional measures can be put in place. McKevitt for supplementary. Thank you, and I'd welcome the, uh, uh, the minister's response. And let's hope some of the CCTV have the infrared mode, so when the lights go out, that people will be able to see in and around the crane. But can, would the minister consider further security measures to ensure that the users of the public transport uh, feel safe to leave their uh, vehicles? Um, knowing that they are going to be protected. Well, I'm grateful to the member for uh, her question, and of course uh, we, we, we will look at that as part of the issue. I, I, I'm somewhat loath to, 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 to highlight uh, the problem to a scale that would uh, discourage people uh, to uh, not feel that they were somehow not going to be safe. Uh, I think. Uh, there is there's no clear evidence to, to indicate that um, at any of our uh, locations, and we want to, uh, to build on the record levels that we are currently enjoying uh, for, for use of public transport. I think that's a very important message. And of course, uh, security is important. Being safe is very important, and uh, uh, that is a key, key priority not only for myself but also for TransLink. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, given the, the financial pressures he's under, what, what measures are available to him to uh, ensure a continued growth in uh, public transport, uh, particularly easing the pressures uh, on our road system at peak times? Well, can I thank the member for his, uh, his question? Uh, I remain very positive, indeed, about the progress public transport uh, has made over the last uh, three plus years. Uh, on the bus side, uh, numbers continue to perform strongly, with Metro uh, showing the sort of st the steady progress that reflects its growing reliability and popularity. Uh, Rail, however, I think has been the star performer. Rail travel last year passed through the 13 million passenger journey barrier, taking it to levels uh, not seen since the 1960s. Uh, and I compare that to when we took over uh, DRD. Uh, um, when, when 10 million uh, passenger journeys were being uh, made. So, uh, but despite uh, this programme, uh, we have not yet reached a ceiling on rail. Further uh, significant progress has been made on rail this year at the midpoint, and I expect that we may get close to 14 million journeys by the end of this financial year. Um, and if we reach this new high, uh, I will no longer be saying record levels since the 1960s, I will be taking pride to say it will be record levels since the 1950s, uh, a change that I look forward to. Thank you. And may I uh, thank and congratulate uh, the Minister on those uh, record performances in terms of public transport. And, and again, to, to focus in on the road network, I wonder what measures are available to him within uh, very constrained budgets uh, in terms of continuing the growth uh, of public transport and, and easing the pressures on our roads. I want to thank the member for uh, his, his warm congratulations. And, and, uh, uh, despite the uh, uh, well-documented challenges uh, facing my department, <coughs> uh, I am determined uh, to continue the progress that we have made in growing uh, public transport in Northern Ireland. Uh, park and ride is working well, and uh, we, uh, we will continue to increase the number of park and ride facilities with seven further uh, new locations to come online in the next 18 months or so. Uh, you heard earlier where they were. Um, I am pleased that we will be introducing some additional weekend rail services before the end of the year. This will give existing uh, passengers uh, greater choice and act as an incentive to potential new passengers. Um, we will work hard uh, to keep any future fur increases at inflation. Uh, and I will continue to, to press the Finance Minister on ta Tax Smart for rail travel, a measure that has the capacity to make public transport much cheaper. Uh, I can tell the Member, tell the House, that next month we begin the £12 million refurbishment of the Enterprise Service, 
which will in, uh, greatly improve passenger service. Uh, I think also the introduction of audio visual on Metro will be positive for tourists as well as those who are blind and partially sighted. And of course, I'm pleased that Belfast uh, Rapid Transit uh, is being progressed uh, and is still on tar our target for being operational by, by 2017. Peter Weir, for a quick question, no supplementary. Okay. Um, can I ask the Minister, the Minister earlier on today uh, indicated that there would be a number of key strategic uh, off-street car parks which had already been identified for local, regional, um, or local or regional development. Uh, can I ask the Minister, perhaps not now, but at least then, to outline uh, where those are and what value each of those car parks would be? Well, I'm grateful to the, uh, to the member for, for his question. And uh, indeed, uh, I was pleased that the uh, second stage of the, of, of the bill, the transfer of powers to local government, uh, was uh, successfully moved uh, earlier today. Uh, and uh, I, I, I wasn't sure if the member wanted a, a list for his own um, constituency or indeed more generally. He, uh, his sign language is working very well. Um, I thought it was a film, but it's not. Um, <laughs> so we will. <laughs> oh, oh, and, oh, and oh. the same to you. <laughs> and, oh, no, it wasn't that. Right. Um, so. Uh, we will provide that information uh, as quickly and as completely as possible. I say and tell me the time is up. Thank you very much, Minister. And we must now move on to.